so hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, great to be here again. Um, yeah, today we're basically going to talk about um, automating the vulnerability management process. Um, before we dive in a little bit about myself, so in the last um, five years I've been at Resilient and my last role I led the research team. Uh, before that I worked at PayPal doing various security roles. Uh, I've been in and out vulnerability management from various kind of uh, uh, perspective from a practitioner side doing automation for vulnerability management at PayPal and then from the research side at Resilient uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, currently I'm uh, working on uh, uh, hopefully starting a new venture. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell. So because uh, we're kind of in a sp spooky motif uh, at B-Sides, I thought it would be appropriate to talk about that uh, from the three ghosts of Christmas kind of perspective. So we have the, uh, we're gonna have a visit from the ghost of vulnerability management past, the ghost of vulnerability management uh, present, and the ghost of vulnerability management future. Um, yeah, and in cybersecurity, we, we usually uh, fight kind of invisible enemies. So today we're going to summon these ghosts to help us understand um, kind of where we're at with vulnerability management and where we can hopefully get. Um, so let's uh, dive in. Let's travel back in time a bit, if you will, to the early 2000s. This is a good time. Um, so the vulnerability landscape back then, we had very limited visibility. The scope was mainly focused around uh, network and OS vulnerabilities. Um, we lived in a much simpler time where most of the code that we had was code that we, were, we have written or knew uh, uh, intimately. And obviously it was the pre-DevOps day, so um, we had a lot of uh, of fears and uh, repercussions to uh, change management processes and uh, remediation was a struggle. Um, so I actually took a time to um, um, use the Wayback Machine to, to look at some screenshots from uh, 20 years ago, how the, the top players of today uh, looked at the time. So this is Qualys from 2002. Um, as you see, not much has changed, basically, uh, <laughs> for, and unfortunately, uh, this is the same one. So uh, they had uh, uh, 1,926 different vulnerabilities in their database, which is nice. Today we're at uh, 260,000. Um, and uh, yeah, as you can see, I, I highlighted, so we had an average of 25 vulnerabilities each week. So we'll, we'll see where we're at today, but that was uh, back then. Uh, Rapid7, uh, if you dare to install it with this uh, scary looking guy, then you'll be, uh, this is the, the UI that you would have seen. Uh, as you can see again, uh, or not really see, but um, a lot of the vulnerabilities are kind of network, network based oriented. And they say they test for over 980 vulnerabilities, different vulnerabilities, which is nice. Um, and this is Tenable uh, from 2003. Um, so that's how we looked 20 years ago. Let's discuss, snap back into the present and discuss how, we, how are things looking today. So first, a lot has changed. Uh, we dress better, that's one, but uh, software is embedded in every aspect of our lives now. Uh, code is released much faster, we have DevOps, we have DevSecOps. Uh, our software is not just ours, it's mainly not ours, actually. We have a lot of third party, whether it's commercial or open source uh, dependencies that we use. Uh, obviously, the move to the cloud has expanded the attack surface and it has also changed kind of the paradigm where things had, in the past were very static and today uh, things are constantly changing Machines are going up, going down, changing IPs. Everything is much more dynamic. And obviously attackers uh, have not stayed put and they are uh, quicker at identifying and exploiting the, the gaps. Um, 
in terms of numbers, so if we were at, uh, at 25 new vulnerabilities each week, so today we're almost at 110 daily. Um, so uh, a lot has changed in that perspective um, in terms of the volumes. Um, and I don't think it's worth, like I need to mention, but security teams haven't, uh, aren't growing 40% year over year uh, like the operation team. So that's kind of where we're at. And this is a good uh, uh, visualization that, that demonstrated. it. So uh, if we said uh, we had less than 200, uh, 2,000 vulnerabilities in, uh, two, in the early 2000s, now we're at 260,000. Uh, with over s almost 800 vulnerabilities uh, each week uh, being added. Obviously, we saw that uh, even NVD uh, in the last uh, almost a year now uh, can't really keep up with the space. There are a lot of problems with uh, managing these volumes. And the thing is that, um, as you can see in the, like the lower kind of uh, part of the graph, only a fraction of the vulnerabilities are ever exploited. So we're talking roughly 5%. Um, so this is where we're at, and this trend, this, the, the gap between the blue line and the red line isn't something that is going to stop. So it's not, this is, this is safe to expect that this is the same trend, if not worse, that we'll see in 2030, 2035, so the gaps will only grow wider. So the landscape has changed, but the way we, have, we do vulnerability management, unfortunately, has not. We're still very reactive. Uh, the majority of organizations are still prioritizing based on CVSS scores. By the way, in a uh, raise of hands, um, I don't know how many of you are uh, actually practicing vulnerability management for, or for the best of your knowledge, how many of the companies that you work with rely solely or mostly on CVSS for uh, prioritization vulnerabilities? Yeah, quite a few hands, okay. Um, so we did went to from fix everything, which was what was common at the time to fix the highs and the crits, the highs and the criticals, which is progress, you could say. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not, uh, it's not really, because uh, as you can see, about 60% of the vulnerabilities are high and critical vulnerabilities. So it's not really a reduction in terms of the scale. It's not really scalable. Um, it isn't effective because as we saw, only a fraction of vulnerabilities will ever be exploited. So we're wasting our limited resources attending, triaging, fixing, remediating vulnerabilities uh, that have little to no impact on your actual risk posture. Um, and obviously, attackers are not relying on CVSS to choose which vulnerabilities to target. Um, for example, so 12% of the CISA CAV are medium and low vulnerabilities. So, um, so there's that. Um, and as I said, it's not scalable as well. So. Um, um, the average organization uh, from uh, Cynthia Institute Research gets to about 10% of the vulnerability backlog in a given month. So if we have 57% of vulnerabilities that are high and critical, and you get to only 10% of those, then you're not really uh, closing the gap. And uh, I think the most important aspect is that while the, still the, like the go-to for prioritization is CVSS, this, uh, the way that we use CVSS is basically CVSS based, the CVSS base score. And it's not really a reflection of risk because uh, risk is multifaceted. So it has, um, I guess you know this formula, but um, it uh, is kind of a combination of the uh, threat, the vulnerability, and the impact. Um, so, and CVSS is a measure of the vulnerability. So, it's not uh, like you can't assume that it's a good reflection of risk because it's on, it only gives you a, a very specific perspective. Um, so clearly this isn't working. Um, and I think um, as we saw, nothing dramatic has changed in the way that we do vulnerability management while a lot has changed and it's keep changing in, the envi in our environments. So we need to think differently. We need, we need a paradigm shift. We can't Continue, to doing the, continue doing the same things and expect things to change because they won't. Um, and this is, I think, a good kind of reflection of where we're at when it comes to vulnerability management, where we're heads down, you know, drowning in vulns, uh, but we're not thinking about maybe there's a, a more efficient way 
um, of doing things differently. Um, so, which brings us to our last visit today uh, from the, the ghost of VM future. So if, if we try to look into the future of how kind of, uh, what's the, uh, the optimistic VM scenario of the future would look like? Um, uh, that, yeah? Uh, no, I w I'm not sure that I can't see, you know, all the specifics. So I'm not sure this is what, you know, at least uh, Leonardo and uh, Dali, that's, that, that's his view. This is after I don't know how many takes. There were a lot creepier images of, of, the, of the vulnerability management in the future. I'm giving you just a glimpse of the, of the nice one. Uh, anyway, so we have a scale issue, right? Um, we have limited resources. We can't get to everything. Um, and in order to tackle scale issues, we have basically two ways. We, need, we can either prioritize, uh, which is what we're trying to do today, but that's one aspect. The other aspect is automation. Uh, because if, we're still, uh, uh, if we still have manual processes, that, uh, and a lot of them, it's not really scalable. So I'll try to focus today on the, uh, on the automation aspect. Um, and obviously, we need to move from a reactive stance that we're um, we're in today into a more proactive stance um, and from gut feelings uh, to more kind of data-driven decisions. So how does a kind of complete vulnerability management process looks like? So basically these are the phases. So we have discovery, we have assessment, then we prioritize, we have reporting, and then we hopefully remediate, verify, and then rinse and repeat, right? Um, so in a perfect world, each one of these aspects would be automated. Uh, in reality, some pieces are more uh, complex to automate uh, than others. Today, I'll mostly explore the, th the first three parts, so the discovery, the assessment, and the prioritization. Um, remediation is also a big challenge, but that's a topic for a complete different kind of talk, conversation. Uh, so in the interest of time, I won't discuss all of the aspects. Uh, so just that to give, to give some context. So first, even before that cycle that we saw earlier, in my perspective, vulnerability management starts even before you do the discovery. So vulnerability management starts, should start with the basics. So asset management, hardening, uh, code debloat, getting rid of code that's not being used, which is just redundant attack surface, um, removing unused components or packages from your OSs, from your images, from your applications. Uh, obviously, regular upgrades and patches, even regardless of, of vulnerabilities, of end-of-life software, end-of-support software, um, and obviously all of the, like the, the pen testing, red teaming, breach and attack simulation aspect of, of and tabletop exercises of actually validating your controls. Um, so that's also an important aspect of a kind of a, a complete vulnerability management. Because if you would have, if you would do all these things, you'll be in a much better place, uh, much better off, and a lot less noise to start with. So that's one thing that I wanted to kind of highlight. Um, and I think um, in terms of the discovery aspect, so I gave a talk last year about uh, uh, the second bullet, which is kind of the security tool coverage and the variance we have uh, between the performance and the, the results of the different tools, the false positives, the false negatives. So I won't go too much into that, but if you want, there's a, again a talk from last year at Breaking Ground that I gave that kind of dives deep into that subject. Obviously, we have the software identification problem, which is a problem, it's unsolved. Uh, we know the state of CPE, there are initiatives with Perl, Swid, uh, but this still kind of requires community effort um, um, that kind of tries to address that, that problem. So just as, a, as an anecdote, so you have a FTP, so it can be an FTP node package or it can be the FTP Linux um, uh, binary. So um, if you're based on CPE, it's, uh, for a lot of the vulnerability management tools, it's hard to make that differentiation, then you get things that are not really there. Um, so that's kind of, that it, it has, it's, again, it's, it's a topic of its own. Uh, feel free to um, take a look at the talk from last year. And I think SBOM, 
um, is kind of an opportunity to address some of the issues that we discussed. So for example, all the attack surface reduction. How do I know which software um, I don't use? Um, end of life, end of support, drift detection. So let's say I have Chrome in my environment and I have 100,000 hosts. So even if I plot, I have an SBOM, I can plot all of the different versions of Chrome, then I will get outliers of Chrome versions that are not updated, that I have probably a problem with the auto-update process. So this, this, these are things that, that an SBOM can surface. And uh, the Pareto principle is also something important because again, we have limited resources. Basically, we're talking about um, uh, risk management. Uh, so we need to focus on the risks that are most, or the, the vulnerabilities, the gaps that are most impactful in terms of risk reduction. So if we, for example, plot the, the different packages in our environment, and there is one package that if we fix that, it will solve a huge chunk of our vulnerabilities, we're probably better off starting with that. Or, and you can take the same kind of perspective into hosts. So we have a host that if we deal with that, it will uh, reduce a lot of our attack surface, a uh, package, a container image, a OS image, whatever. But it's a really strong principle, and I think it's, it's not really being utilized today in a normal uh, kind of VM space. Um, obviously, surfacing um, tool and data coverage gaps. So if I, if I see, uh, once I connect data from various sources that look at the same kind of data points, so I have uh, an S-bomb that is being generated in my uh, uh, in my CI from GitHub, GitLab, Sneak, whatever, from source code, and then I have the same SBOM from my SCA, and then I have the same SBOM from my uh, binary analysis tool. Just the differences between all these different stages in the SDLC can provide a lot of valuable insights. So maybe I have things that my vendor provided an SBOM, but I don't see them, or I see different things. Uh, or I see things that are in my dev environment that don't make it to production because they're dev dependency. So a lot of insight can surface from that. And obviously the main advantage is that it's machine readable. So it allows for the automation aspect that we'll discuss. Um, so that's about the discovery. Let's kind of move on and this is kind of the big bulk. Uh, we have the assess and prioritize kind of phases that I, basically it's the triage aspect of vulnerability management. Um, and Vulnerability triage is by far one of the most specific, painstaking processes in cybersecurity. Anyone who has done it for a while uh, has the scars to, to show it. Um, and I think the reason that that's, the, the, that's kind of uh, the state, the situation, is because a vulnerability is only relevant in context, right? So a CVE is not, you can have a thousand uh, instances of the same CVE in your environment and in each place they can mean completely different things uh, because you need context you know so you need asset context is this asset exposed to the network or not uh, did it have past incidents uh, what's the asset criticality what's the criticality of the information that is on that asset we need business context so who's the owner what's the ownership information am I mandated to uh, SLAs uh, or certain uh, policies or regulations um, the threat context so as, as we discussed earlier only a fraction of vulnerabilities will ever be exploited so exploitability is a very strong signal so is this vulnerability likely to be exploited is it already exploited in the wild um, does it have an exploit POC or not? Obviously the vulnerability context, so all of the metadata from the vulnerability, uh, the description, the, the CWE, the CPE, um, and where did that vulnerability surface from? Is it from a, a generic scan? Is it from my pen testing? Is it from my um, uh, bug bounty program? So all these things matter differently. Uh, runtime context, so is this thing even loaded? Is it actually being used? So this comes to the, the reachability analysis aspect. And do I have a compensating control? Do I have an EDR in place? Don't I have an EDR in place? Do I have a firewall rule? Don't I have a firewall rule? Um, and we have the remediation context, so what's the operational risk? Um, do I have a fix available? Is it code that is in my control or is it a third party that I'm reliant on someone else to fix it and then I need to have some kind of mitigation in place? Um, and how much effort would it cost me to remediate? Do I need to restart the machine uh, or not? So, so that's all the, all the pieces of information that you need to have in order to make a kind of an educated uh, decision about what's important and what's less. 
important. And again, in this, under this playing field where we have limited resources and we can't get to anything, this is, this is a must. And the problem is that currently all of these data points are very dispersed um, in various sources, various security tooling, so, uh, which leads us to uh, uh, basically uh, doing it manually. So these are the challenges. Again, the data is very fragmented. We have data quality issues. We have completeness issues. We need to communicate because oftentimes we need different teams have different perspectives into these kind of pieces of context. Um, a lot of noise, a lot of false positive, false negatives. Again, this is an uh, entire topic of its own. And our environments are constantly changing. So it's not like in 2002 where you had a rack, a server, which was there unless you updated the firmware. It stayed like that. Like, we're living in a much more dynamic environment and vulnerability management hasn't really kept up with that uh, pace. Um, and ultimately, we need context. Again, uh, vulnerability isn't relevant without, you know, out of context. Um, so, okay, so th these are kind of the problems, but we're optimistic here, right? We're talking about the utopian future. So I'll try to uh, um, touch upon various points that I think are our uh, potential for changing kind of the current status quo. So the Transparency Exchange API, CSAF, VEX, um, and kind of attestations that go with it. SSVC and the word that is uh, spoken too much in this, uh, in our conferences lately, but I won't, that's, I, anyway, I won't go into too much into that because I think even like without AI, we can still do much better than we do today. So uh, let's start. Transparency Exchange API, or T. So basically, it's a, a standard format agnostic API for exchanging kind of supply chain uh, transparency artifacts between systems. Uh, it's a Cyclone DX kind of community project, and it aims to kind of standardize uh, that API as, an, as a standard, as an ECMA standard. So it's fairly, um, fairly early days uh, in the work. You're welcome to, by the way, check out the the working group, I, I posted a link, uh, like I have references in the end with a link to the, to the GitHub page. Um, the elements that it currently under scope is XBOMB, so not only SBOMB, but only hardware bomb, cryptography bomb, AI bomb, SAS bomb, et cetera. Uh, Cyclone DX attestations, uh, VDRs, so vulnerability disclosure reports, VEX that we'll uh, dive deeper into and common lifecycle enumeration, so all of the aspects of the evolvement of the product lifetime, so end of life, end of support, um, mergers and acquisitions, all that kind of information is also kind of in scope. Um, and this is, again, once you have a way to exchange these kind of artifacts between different tools in a machine-readable way, that has a lot of potential, and, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll show how, how it becomes more practical in a minute. Um, so that's one. Um, next we have uh, CSAF, which is the Common Security Advisory Framework. How many are familiar with, uh, with CSAF, just in a raise of hands? So we have a few, but not enough. Okay, great. So basically CSAF is a, a machine-readable security advisory. That's the, the aim. So if today uh, it's an OASIS standard, uh, that's uh, what's driving the project. Uh, so if today a security advisory it can be a PDF, it can be a text file, it can be an HTML file, it can be an XML format, basically depends on the vendor. Uh, CSAF aims to automate it uh, in a way that is A, discoverable, so you know where you can find that resources and, and, uh, and um, uh, ingest it, and two, machine readable. Um, so basically, uh, and, and it has also a VEX profile. Again, I'll, I'll explain VEX shortly in more detail. So basically, we want to go from this into this, which you don't see very clearly, so I'll try to zoom in, but basically it's a JSON. So uh, it allows you to communicate changes or updates in the advisory over time in a way that is, again, machine readable and can be consumed by machines or tools, uh, which is a huge it's huge, okay, so, uh, so here you can see an example. I'm not sure how, how well you can see the, the text, but um, uh, for example, um, you have 
uh, a, a snippet that said, okay, fix software. Cisco has released uh, free update server, uh, up, uh, software updates that address the vulnerability described in this advisory. And then you have a couple of other uh, updates about the vulnerability um, that, uh, for example, this vulnerability affects Cisco devices that are running a vulnerable release of Cisco IOS or Cis uh, IDSXC software, blah, 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 and install a specific client feature. Um, and then the last one, uh, it's a kind of exploitation uh, update then that Cisco is aware that this thing is actually being exploited in the wild. Um, and there are a lot of uh, um, vendors, big vendors, that are already utilizing and generating uh, CSAF, so Cisco, Red Hat, Siemens, Oracle, um, and more. Um, but it's still not enough, obviously, but it's a good start. Um, but I think that this is something that, again, if we want to get to a point where we automate this process, CSAF or a CSAF-like thing is a must. Um, so now you have we, software that you can potentially automate the consumption aspect of security advisories. Um, so that's, yeah, which is what is written here. Okay, nice. Uh, but why stop here? So let's dive into the next kind of aspect, which is VEX, the Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange. Hopefully more people know that one. Can I get kind of a raise of hand just to get a feeling of the one? Oh, not many more, okay. Uh, or not okay, but okay, so what's VEX? Uh, basically, it lets you know a, a way to communicate whether a product is or isn't affected by a vulnerability X in a machine-readable way. Again, we're all about machine readability and automation. Um, so is a vulnerability exploitable? And, and it has several flavors, which isn't good. This kind of, uh, it's not uh, a lot of different standards, but that's kind of the, the realm, and I'll try to explain the differences between one, the, uh, each one. So we have the CSAFX profile, as, as I discussed. We have Cyclone DXVEX, we have SPDXVEX, we have OpenVEX, which is kind of a lightweight version, uh, and we have CSAFX, which tries to be a more kind of encompassing, kind of general kind of guidance into the format. Um, but basically, it allows you to handle false positives. From a vendor perspective, it lets you save money on support because you can say, okay, I'm Cisco, I'm Intel. I'll let you know whether a specific vulnerability is relevant for my router in version whatever. So you don't have to send me an email or open a ticket or call my phone center. So um, it, it reduces a lot of that burden. Uh, but uh, personally, again, this is kind of my perspective, I think the strength of VEX isn't from the vendor side. Uh, it's important from the vendor side, but the, the real potential is actually from the consumer side, and that's I'll try to explain why. Um, also, uh, it can be either embedded within an S-bomb, but it can also be detached. It, it's not a must. Uh, so um, it's also something that I think uh, uh, is worth mentioning. And there, there are several flavors, but the principle is the same. So. Um, I'll try to kind of uh, touch up uh, uh, on the different uh, aspects. So VEX basically lets you set a status for vulnerability. So whether it's affected, not affected, this is for CISA, SPDX, and Open VEX. I'll, I'll see, I'll, anyway, I'll, I'll show what the difference in the different formats. But is it uh, affected, not affected, fixed, or under investigation? Um, and then you can, uh, if it's not, um, if it's not affected, then you need to provide a justification. So why is it not affected? Um, so, and in, uh, in CSAF, it's a bit different. CSAF tries to um, look at it from a kind of product perspective, so not a specific uh, CVE. So then you can specify which are the version, the first version that was affected, uh, when it was first fixed. Uh, it's kind of an enum, right, like a list. So what are the known affected versions or not affected version? When it was last affected, what's the recommended fix, et cetera? Um, so that's kind of in the CISA format of uh, VEX. And then um, in Cyclone DX, it's called states. So uh, you can say whether something is resolved, resolved with pedigree, which basically means that is remediated and you have evidence provided uh, that you can verify about the fix. So a commit, uh, commit hash or, uh, or a diff between the unfixed version and the fixed version. So that's kind of it. Is it exploitable or not? Uh, in triage, so it's kind of like the under investigation that we saw earlier, false positive or not affected. Um, and if it's not affected, again, you have to provide the justification for why it's not affected. So again, it's not very different. Uh, the concept is the same, uh, and the justification in the kind of CISA, SPDX, OpenVEX, and CISAF world are these five. 
uh, which is component not present. Uh, in, uh, inline mitigations already exist. Vulnerable code cannot be controlled by an adversary, or vulnerable code is not in execute path, so this comes down to the reachability aspect. Um, and vulnerable code not present. So I have uh, vulnerability in a specific uh, uh, library, and in a given product, that library doesn't exist, or a specific function, or whatever. Um, and then just the justification for Cyclone DX are a bit more, um, uh, there, there, are, there are nine, not five. So you, uh, but again, pretty similar, but you have like required by the environment, protected by compiler, uh, protected at perimeter, or protected by mitigating control. So it's again, a bit different, but I think we should look at the bigger picture, like the, the specifics are less important so much as the fact that now you have a way that you can communicate exploitability status and filter out noise. And again, if we look at it from the, the consumer side, the security tooling side, it allows you to have a machine re readable way to communicate the exploitability status. Um, and, and I'll show why, why I think the, the, uh, the consumer side is the, right, like the kicker here. Um, but I will say that you might ask, okay, how do we trust this thing? And, like, who issues the VEX, it's also kind of a topic for discussion. We can talk about it later if we have uh, time, but then I'll just say briefly that this is where kind of attestations kick in. So you can have attestations, you can have, uh, just if, like, to the justification, you can have metadata that says, okay, who determined it, whether it's a, a human analyst or it's a security tool or etc. So, but uh, again, that's kind of uh, technicalities. So how does this help? How does a process like this look like? So let's say we have a new uh, RC vulnerability in a library, let's call it FOG2K, I don't know. Um, um, and then um, it's exploitable only via the network and under a specific configuration. Okay, that's kind of, that's the vulnerability. It's very common, everyone has it. Um, so this is kind of in the world with CSAF and VEX, this is how kind of the triage process looks like. So first you can query your S-bomb, and then you, then you see that you have, maybe I'll do it here. Can, you can still hear me fine? Good. So you query your S-bomb, you say, okay, I have 80 uh, uh, instances of that uh, vulnerability present in proprietary third party open source code. Okay, so we know now we have a CSAF, so I can query and see, see the security advisory, and let's say the, oh, you don't see because of the full screen, but it says, um, so I can issue a VEX, like the, in the CSAF we have a VEX profile that says the vulnerable code is not present. So, okay, vulnerable code not present, not exploitable, I have a VEX, it's machine readable, great. So what about the other uh, 16 instances which are not, I, I couldn't find a, a CSAF because again, it's not, uh, I don't know, the vendor didn't provide it, whatever. So now we go to the next phase. Let's say I have a reachability analysis tool that can tell me whether something is reachable or not. Is it being used? Um, and then we see, okay, let's say we have eight of the instances out of the 16 are reachable, uh, but eight are not. So okay, if they're not, let's issue a VEX statement and say vulnerable code is not in execute path. So we got rid of that as well. Um, and then, okay, for the other eight, maybe I have a network tool that can tell me that uh, the vulnerability is only exploited via the network, right? We know that. So if it's protected, it's not exposed to the internet, then it's not relevant as well. So then we issue a VEX statement with the justification that the vulnerable code cannot be controlled by an adversary. Um, so that's that. Okay, fixed, 80 to zero, nice. What about the other 20 in our proprietary code? So again, we have the reachability analysis, let's query that. Okay, we have 15 that are not reachable, not in use, great. Again, vulnerable not code, not in execute path. We are only left with five. Again, we have our network tool that can tell us whether it's reachable or not. Let's query that. We know that uh, uh, there's one instance that is not network facing, great. Again, vulnerable code cannot be controlled by an adversary. So we're left with, out of 100, with four. And we take that four, and maybe we have an application configuration. Again, this is only exploitable under a specific condition. So whether this is a human analyst that, that ha only has to triage four instances instead of 100, that's good. But if, if you have a security tool with visibility into the configuration that it, you can query, then you can automate that aspect as well. And let's say that three are not exploitable because it, they don't use that specific configuration. So again, you issue a VEX statement, vulnerable code cannot be controlled by an adversary. So you're left with one. This is the only one you need to address. And all of this is automatic, like the entire triage process. So all the false positives of the world 
uh, again, it's not all of a wish, but, but again, you, you can filter out a lot of the noise. So this is kind of the strength, the way I see it, with CSAF and VEX, uh, hopefully in the future, uh, hopefully not too far away. Um, and then, okay, what about, uh, so this is a one example, maybe a bit optimistic, but uh, we have another layer, which is uh, also something that I really I strongly believe in, SSVC, which is the stakeholder specific vulnerability categorization. Again, kind of raise of hands, so I know the, where we're at, okay, none, okay, good, or not good, but, uh, uh, basically, it's a method methodology for prioritization vulnerability, prioritizing vulnerability based on the needs of a specific stakeholders, because different stakeholders have different uh, perspective, different needs, um, and different um, risk appetite, different way that they make decisions in terms of risk. It's a transparent way. Basically, it's a decision tree. I'll show it in a bit. It's explainable. It's modular. You can change it like the, anyway, we'll see it. Um, and most importantly, it can take into account multiple facets of risk. So if we rem uh, go back to the early uh, part of the talk. So how does that look like? So this is again like a, a specific example. So we have, again, it's a decision tree. Um, so let's say that uh, the first kind of layer in the tree is the exploitation, like the threat context. So in this case, I take into account uh, CISA CAV, EPSS, threat intelligence, to know, okay, how likely is this vulnerability to be exploited? So if I have active exploitation, that's one thing. Maybe it's highly likely to be exploited, maybe it's not likely, and again, like the decision nodes are less relevant than the, than, like the concept. So okay, let's say that if, if I have active exploitation, obviously, then it's, a, it's one thing. Okay, so the next kind of phase in the tree, let's take the vulnerability context that we know. So let's say, we want to see if the vulnerability is automatable. What is automatable? Um, it's uh, the attack vector is from the network. It doesn't require any privileges or no authentication. Um, so that's obviously, if it is, that's something that is more important than for me. Again, let's, it's a metaphoric discussion, but I decide that for me it's more important than if it's not, then okay, we get here. And now what's the impact? So now I can take into account um, uh, various aspects like uh, my asset criticality, data exposure, um, uh, would I need downtime, what's the financial loss, et cetera, et cetera. So I make this decision and now if the impact is high, I act now. If it's medium, I act now. If it's low, maybe I'm, I keep track um, and, and get to it after I finish all the act, right? So this is kind of the, the tree, and, and you can see as you go right, basically you get to, to things that you're, you're tracking, um, but they are far less important. So if exploitation is not likely, and it's not automatable, and the impact is low, or even if it's high, but again, it, the exploitation is not likely because you have no indication, low EPSS score, hard to exploit vulnerability, um, um, basically all of the decision points that we took in the past, then maybe I don't need to treat it now. So if I have unlimited resources, sure, I'll get to it. But, um, but, but uh, I need to start somewhere. Again, it's the same kind of, the playing field is this. I have limited resources and I need to uh, decide where do I put those uh, in action. Um, and um, so let, let's try kind of to put it all together. So this is how I kind of envision it. So you have the scan results and then you have CSAF and VEX that can, that can kind of take away all of the things that are not relevant deterministically because you have context. And again, I will caveat and say that is, it's not exploitable in a single point in time because our, our environments are dynamic. It has to be something continuous. So maybe something isn't loaded today, it will be loaded tomorrow. Something is not in use today, it will be in use tomorrow. A configuration isn't there today, it will be there tomorrow. So, but again, this is where I, like the security tooling have the capability, hopefully, if they are applied correctly, uh, again, we come back to the basics and, and we have the coverage and we have all these aspects that we talked initially to, to provide as insight. And then, okay, all of the things that I'm not sure about, then I can, again, we come back to the risk management aspect and I can take uh, the SSVC model, which is basically, again, a decision tree, the same logic that you apply to decide whether to treat something or not, Let's formulate it, let's communicate it internally, externally. This is how we manage risk here. Um, 
and then um, I'm left with the most impactful vulnerabilities. And then you start here and work your way out. Um, so that's uh, the way that I see the future of uh, vulnerability management and how I think we can move away from this kind of whack-a-mole reactive stance that we're in now. Uh, so I'll say uh, the future is already here. A lot of these things aren't science fiction. They are uh, obviously in work, still a lot to go, but some of the things are already here. Um, so the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. This paradigm shift is inevitable. Like if, if you don't feel the pain today, you'll feel it tomorrow. If you don't feel it tomorrow, you'll feel it in air. And NVD is certainly feeling it today uh, or for a few months now. Um, so something has to change. Um, and I will say start thinking about how do, how do you define risk in your organization. Uh, this, is, this process alone is, is super valuable. And you can start simple. It doesn't have to be all the things. Even you know, a decision tree with two nodes is, is even it's something. Um, and again, this is something that I can't stress enough. In order to do to effectively manage uh, the risk, you have to take into account all uh, a lot of sources of context, but bas basically various aspects of uh, of, uh, of risk. Um, so yeah, we've traveled through time. Uh, we saw the ghost of the past, the promise of the future. Uh, so hopefully, we'll get to a future where we're not afraid of ghosts or vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, I will say again, people often ex expect kind of want like a single number. Tell me how to prioritize. I want the CVSS score. Is it a nine? Is it a five? It's nice. It's not realistic. Um, uh, risk is much more complex than that. And I think the key is how do we model that complexity into our automatic processes? Um, and how do we integrate these different sources of context which we have uh, into a decision? Um, so uh, yeah, that's it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, I would love to take them. If anyone's interested in this topic, this is a topic I'm very passionate about, I love talking about. So feel free to reach out, whether it's on LinkedIn, Twitter, or in person. I uh, would like to discuss this further. Um, yeah, thank you all. Uh, we do have a few minutes for uh, so a couple of questions. questions. Yeah, and sure, um, there's some references and, also if you want to take a picture of for some of the things that I talked about. So just go ahead and uh, raise your hand and I'll uh, pass you the mic. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so this is cool. And you know, I agree this is the inevitable future. Yeah. I can't talk. But today, when I have vulnerabilities, I have an auditor that tells me what I have to fix. Mm -hmm. How do we convince the auditors that this is something we need to do? That, that's, a, that's a great question. I think that is, that is key because I can have a crystal ball. I have it actually now, but I'm not using it because even if I tell you what are the three vulnerabilities out of the 100,000 that will be exploited in your environment by an adversary tomorrow, then your auditor will tell you, okay, but you still need to patch everything CVSS 4 and above. Yep. So that disconnect is something that has to change. So I'm, this is something that I'm very passionate about. I think we talked about it. Uh, I think what gives me a sliver of hope is that most auditors don't say fix everything anymore. That used to be the case. So things can change. It will take time. I think the data-driven approach, the explainability, the evidence, that is something that is crucial in order to, to uh, convince the auditor. Uh, and I think this is something that as a community we must work together to change because otherwise we can have yeah, I can talk about, you know, my, my breath out about it and nothing will ever change. So, yeah. It, it goes beyond auditors. It's, it's uh, compliance for mm -hmm. government regulations for sure. that you have to comply with uh, yeah. government regulations. So, so hopefully, like, again, the trend won't change. Eventually, the, the chips will fall. Like, uh, it's inevitable. I think we need to make sure that it happens sooner rather than later. And we need to drive that change uh, because... Again, this is the only way I, I see to get on top of this thing. Um, so. Thanks for bringing up the, uh, the awareness. Yeah, sure, my pleasure. Cool.
Well, thanks, guys. Thank you very much.